Welcome to Jamaica Magazine, I am Theodore Henry. One thing has come under the microscope as the world grapples with COVID-19 is access to food. You've seen the rush on supermarkets and yes, our farmers continue to grow, but how can you supplement the food available from those sources? We explore that and other issues in today's program. Stay with me as I take you through the pages. What to do if you think you have been exposed or are experiencing signs and symptoms of COVID-19? Immediately call 888-1LOVE. That's 888-663-5683. In addition, you should stay at home. Don't go to work, school, or any public place. Do not use public transport and avoid visitors to your home. You may need to do this for up to 14 days to reduce the spread of the infection. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Before we go any further, I don't think we can stress this enough, so here goes. Coronaviruses are large family of viruses that cause illnesses ranging from the common cold to more severe respiratory diseases. It is spread from person to person mainly through the droplets produced when an infected person speaks, coughs, or sneezes, just like the common cold and flu. So let's review some of the common indicators you need to look out for. Respiratory symptoms, such as fever, cough, shortness of breath, and difficulty breathing. But check this, severe cases can cause pneumonia, severe acute respiratory syndrome, kidney failure, and even death. Unfortunately, at this moment, there is no known cure for COVID-19, but preventative measures can be taken. Guys, remember, wash your hands, cough in your elbow, or cough and sneeze in a tissue, and please, throw it away after you've used it once. Practice social distance and let us do what's best as we aim to make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business in good health. Now make diseases spread, wash your hands with soap and water instead Wash them regular or use a hand sanitizer, make sure the germs them dead Touching your eyes or your mouth or your nose, wash your hands before you do things like those After you use the bathroom before preparing food, come on, wash your hands them clean One of the things doctors advise now is to boost your immune system And you do that by eating foods rich in vitamin C and other critical nutrients but have you considered that you can grow quite a few of those and you don't need a farm to do it? Right now might be a good time to start some backyard gardening and grow healthy foods that boost your health and save your pockets. Check this out. This garden is beautiful, right? Well, it took quite some time and a lot of hard work to get it to this stage. Did you get it in someone's backyard? It is. Backyard gardening is one sure way of eating healthy and saving money. Today, both you and I will be learning some important pointers on growing our very own garden. So, come, let's dig some dirt. With me is Master Gardener Rashida Linton. She'll be telling us what to consider when choosing a location for a garden. Rashida, this looks like a good enough location. It is. This is quite okay. You mm -hmm. need to ensure that your property is located in an area that mm -hmm. receives anywhere from 6 to 8 hours of sunlight per day. Okay. In fact, you need to also ensure that it gets adequate amount of water. Mm -hmm. It could be either a water tank, okay. a roof gutter, or just a simple tap. You know what? Chris, he's well informed, very experienced. This is his property. Okay. He'll be able to tell you anything you want to know. Chris, this is Kerry. Kerry, this is Chris. She's interested Hello. in farming. Please tell her anything she wants to know. See you guys later. Okay. All right, later. Chris, look, I'm going to do some farming. Good. <laughs> yeah, okay. all right. Get geared up. You'll need gloves and rubber boots. First, clear the land of stones, tins, broken glass or other types of trash and large sticks or plastics that will hinder your plant's growth. Next, use the fork to dig the area and loosen the soil. You may want to make sure that you fork at least 10 to 12 inches or roughly 25 to 35 centimeters so that your plant roots grow easily. This is also the time that you should add whatever animal manure you have to the soil. Also, you may consider adding sand to improve soil structure and drainage. You want a nice, crumbly texture. How much manure do you need? 
use one kilogram or about 2.5 pounds of chicken manure or four kilograms or eight pounds of cow dung or goat manure to one square meter or a yard sized bed. Fork the manure well into the soil and keep forking to mount a raised bed that is at least 3 feet wide or 90 centimeters and 20 to 30 centimeters or 1 to 12 inches high. Keeping the width at 3 feet will make it easier for you to sow, weed, water and reap from the outside in without having to reach too far. To further ensure that your soil is free from pests and diseases, cover the soil with plastic for a few weeks. Cut large garbage bags down to the side seams and lay them on top of the soil to cover. You can use stones around the edges to keep the bags in place. The plastic covering will allow the soil to get heated in the sun and over time this will kill most of the insects, pests and viruses that might be living in the soil. If you are fencing your plot, you should do that now too. Dig holes at least 1 foot or 30 centimeters. These holes should be at least 2 feet away from each corner of your raised bed. This will give you enough room to walk around as well as bend for sowing, weeding and watering. Next, one by one, set your fence posts in each hole and fill them in. Then, nail chicken wire around your plot, making sure to leave an opening for entrance and exit. This is good, but you know you don't have to go through all this trouble. There is a much simpler way, especially for persons who don't have enough space. Okay. It is called containerized garden. You need to ensure that you have access to a good amount of water along with six to eight hours of sunlight per day. In fact, Bridget has a containerized garden. Let's go and see her. Bridget! This is Kerry. Kerry, this is Bridget. Hi. Bridget has a container garden. Okay. Kerry is interested in doing containerized gardening. Please give her all the information she yeah. needs. Okay. Later, guys. All right, Later. then. Take care. Later. Hi, Kerry. Hi. You have actually come good time because I'm just about to transplant some tomatoes. Okay. Right. Okay. So, this is my container. When you grow in containers, you must have a proper drainage. If you buy clay or plastic flower pots, they will have holes punched in the bottom for this purpose. But if you are making your own, you must make sure you punch holes in the bottoms and sides so that the plants won't get waterlogged and develop root rot. As for getting the right soil mix, making sure you have really good healthy soil is even more important in container gardening than it is in raised bed gardening. That's because the soil in pots is shallower and can dry out more easily. Most container plants do best with a mix of soils. One part loamy soil, one part sand, and one part humus. Because potted soil does not easily retain nutrients, you should add six tablespoons of fertilizer to soil. Once you've put the right mix of soil in your pots, allow them to settle for a week or two before planting. The next thing to think about is choosing the right crop to grow in your pots. The most ideal plants for container gardening are callaloo, tomato, peppers, lettuce, cabbage, cucumber, legumes, condiments and herbs. Thank you so much Ms. Williams for all your help. Yeah, Boy, backyard gardening, not easy. But hey, at least now we know about site selection and container gardening. Backyard living, not bad at all. Protect yourself from the flu virus. Visit your nearest health center or doctor to get the flu vaccine. Cover your mouth and nose when coughing and sneezing. Wash your hands regularly with soap and water or by using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Avoid the spread of germs by not touching your eyes, mouth or nose. And be sure to regularly disinfect surfaces and objects that are used often. Remember, your health is your responsibility. As you get your backyard or side yard or veranda gardening going, a good way to keep those plants healthy is using natural fertilizer made from your own table scraps. That's right, we're gonna show you how to set up your own composting at home. Compost is one of the richest form of soil nutrient. So here we are buying fertilizer 
for huge sums of money when in fact we are throwing away something which is richer in many regards than what we are buying, spending hard cash for. We, uh, from time to time, do what we call garbage characterization survey. This is where we actually go island-wide and take samples of the garbage and look at what make up the garbage. All the surveys that are done in recent past points to one particular set of dynamic. The compostables are always the highest. 67% in some survey, 65 in some. We eat vegetables. We do ground provisions, the peelings from those. We use cardboards, newspapers, lots of stuff that can be broken down and can be put to good use. With such a high percentage of the solid waste being compostable, we are therefore forced to look at how we're going to manage in the best way possible, in the most efficient way possible, that high percentage of the garbage. Composting is a rich form of soil that is broken down by microorganisms to become um, either fertilizer or soil. Um, now we're going to do a demonstration to show you how we can do it. First, if we're starting, this is our kitchen waste. So if you're starting a compost bin at home, you need to get your kitchen peel, your banana, your lettuce, your cabbage, your tomatoes, and you cut them in finer particles, it will make it break down much faster. In order for the, the, the microorganism to work effectively, you need moisture, you need hair, and you need heat. You can use a hand shovel or your hands. Too much moisture, will allow the stuff to rot and it won't decompose. And if it is too dry, the microorganisms won't be able to work effectively. So you need to get a right mixture. If you squeeze it to the face, you shouldn't have any water running out of it. If it's dripping, it is okay. If it is running out of it, that means you, had, you have too much water. So now this is our compost. If you keep this moisture in your compost, it will give you a maturity rate of three and a half months. And you'll get this final product, which is this right here. Compost, what it does, the longer it stays into the ground, is the richer it becomes. We're going to demonstrate how we um, use our compost for potting. Um, we're going to pot a few plants using our compost. This plant is called spider fern. It is an indoor plant that does like a fair amount of water. It likes um, a light mixture. The composting can be used for indoor and outdoor plants. This plant is called a bougainvillea. It is an outdoor plant. It likes a lot of sunlight. Um, it blooms a lot and it, it likes dry areas. The compost it's offer drainage, um, it doesn't keep the water too long. This is now six weeks old and this is three weeks after being planted as a seedling using our compost. And this bougainvillea is six weeks after being planted by our compost and they are just blooming, blooming, blooming. This is a mature, mature spider fern that we use for our rentals, and this is about two and a half months old. Actually, NSW in me, the parks that we manage, the beautiful flowers that you see there, the composting that is used to fertilize these plants are actually done within the department here at Parks and Gardens. The other benefit is that we, at the NSWMA, we, we would need less trucks. 
Now, right now, our biggest problem is trucks to remove garbage. Can you imagine if we could take out the 67% which we could convert at source? What that would do to our national budget? Gas oil, repairs of trucks, labor for, for, to work on the trucks. Just look at it. It is huge savings that could come. Exponential is about getting a behavioral change at source that will see significant reduction in solid waste. We want to see this reduction and to so see it in a very tangible way. And we believe that composting provides an excellent opportunity. To properly carry out a hand rub, apply a palmful of the product in your cupped hand, covering all surfaces. Rub your hands palm to palm. Rub your right palm over the back of your left hand with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Rub your hands palm to palm with fingers interlaced. Rub the back of your fingers to opposing palms with fingers interlocked. Rotationally rub backwards and forwards the clasped fingers of your right hand in your left palm and vice versa. Once your hands are dry, they are now safe. Regularly wash your hands for 20 seconds. By now, we're all aware that this is one of our best defenses against getting infected with the novel coronavirus. That also applies when you're busy digging in the soil and planting crops. Check out this innovative, cost-effective method. Based on laws imposed by the United States, Jamaican farmers are required to be certified under the Food Safety Modernization Act, as well as the Global Good Agricultural Practices Global Gap, if they want to export to that country. Given this development, the Rural Agricultural Development Authority, RADA, saw the need to introduce a hand wash station for farmers. It's part of the measures to assist local growers improve sanitation on their farms and fulfill one criteria for export certification. The concept behind this is just a little bit different. Um, usually other hand wash stations will have a gravity fed system, but we, we, what we've done, um, in, we have incorporated a system that was here, that was developed here locally several years now, where we used um, the pump and spray that was introduced some time ago. Although it was introduced for the same concept in terms of showing and things like that, we have used the features of the pump and spray to add a little bit more dynamics to our presentation here. We have a pressurized system. So that calls for a person's self. One person can actually wash their hands here without assistance from somebody else. So you'd go there without contaminating that water source that you have. This hand wash station is not only affordable, it is also easy to assemble. All you need is an iron trolley, three oil kegs, a pump and spray instrument, and some PVC pipes and fittings. From, from there, at a local welder, we, we modify the, the, the trolley and in a way that we could um, install the, the kegs. So, here we have the, the trolley and we, and we weld the handles so, so it would be able to hold the clay steadily. And this is a pump and spray that we can get locally. So how it works is that a farmer or anybody who is working in, in the field would come by the wash station, he would get some soap on, on his hand, okay, and he would pump. He would pump the system. The system, the pair would pressurize the bottle and in return here will displace the water and the water will come up. And then the farmer would wash. After washing, the farmer wouldn't have to touch anything to contaminate his hands. He would just move over, over to the hand towel and dry his hands. It was good. I enjoyed doing it. <laughs> it wasn't hard at all. It 
was just easy. Just put my foot and pump it. it water just come up and I wash my hands. The effects of not having a hand wash station, um, well, it's, it's really more for, for safety as it relates to you, the, the, the farmer. Because what my rather's mandate is also about is to educate farmers on best practices as it relates to agriculture. And the farmer's safety is a part of the best practices that we, we are trying to encourage out there. The team also successfully designed a water pump made using a weed hacker, which can fill a 50-gallon drum in five minutes. This worker can be used for more than one purpose. So a farmer can have a worker but need a water pump, cannot afford a water pump. Now what the farmer can do is just easily retrofit the worker and a pump, merge them together so that you can have a water pump and a worker. So at times, whenever the farmer needs a worker, we just remove the pump and put on the worker section. Farming may be expensive, but through innovation, your basic equipment could be just what you need to ensure greater savings. As you get going on your new growing venture, there's an important risk to public health that you must know about. It's called antimicrobial resistance. Watch this next feature and take action. Traditional farmers, this especially applies to you. In 2015, the World Health Organization declared antibiotic resistance a global threat resulting in the development of a global action plan. By 2016, all member countries were mandated by the United Nations General Assembly to develop an action plan using the global document as a template. Antimicrobials are used around the world to control and treat infections in animals and humans, but their overuse and misuse puts their efficacy at risk. The ultimate objective is to reduce the need for antimicrobials by preventing disease. In this regard, animal diseases and infections should primarily be prevented by ensuring biosecurity, following good production and good management practices, and implementing integrated disease control programs to minimize the occurrence of diseases. Antimicrobial drugs are also used to treat diseases in animals and plants as well as in farming to boost production. The result is that they can end up in the environment, in water and waste from health facilities and farms, and sometimes even in our food. Both our health and agriculture ministries, therefore, have joined forces with the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, to develop a national action plan underscoring the need for a broad-based multi-sectoral approach and response to this rising issue. Not long ago, I sat in the lab looking at a culture plate of a urine sample taken from a 40-odd-year-old lady. And I literally felt chills down my spine as I saw that an organism was growing on it that was resistant to 21 of the 22 antibiotics tested against it and the one antibiotic it was sensitive to would not have worked in real life. This is a scary prospect. And I'm sure persons will wonder, well, what do you do? What do you do with such a patient? So this reinforces the fact that the problem is not coming. It is already here. And bacteria, we can't stop fight. Antibiotics, take them right. Antibiotics, antibiotics. Come make me tell you how to take them right. Only take them from professionals with medical credentials. Do not share them with friends or relations. Use prescriptions, follow instructions. Take them till they're done with no interruptions. Bad bacteria, we can't stop fight. Antibiotics, take them right. What do you do with your leftover antibiotics? Which I'm sure some of you have.
because many persons rarely ever complete the course. Do you return it to the pharmacy, as a good citizen should? Or do you flush it down the toilet? If you do the latter, where does that water go? And how can the antibiotic influence the soil it eventually ends up in and the Kalaloo field it nourishes? Does that have implications for us? AMR is fueled by factors including the less than optimal prescribing of antibiotics by some physicians and inadequate adherence to recommended behaviors by patients including completion of prescribed antibiotic courses. According to the National Survey of the Knowledge, Attitudes and Prescribing Practices of Doctors Regarding Resistance in a Caribbean Country, 80% of Jamaicans reported sharing antibiotics. 50% thought the same antibiotic worked for all infections. Only 14% admitted to asking doctors for antibiotics with doctors giving them antibiotics in 90% of cases. Only 50% thought the course of antibiotics should be finished. In other words, from start to finish. You know, we have this tendency that we start taking it, we feel a little better, and we feel that we don't need to take it again. It's a very important thing, very, very serious, and it's something that we really need to do more to address. Responsible and prudent use of antimicrobial agents include implementing practical measures and recommendations intended to improve animal health and animal welfare while preventing or reducing the selection, emergence, and spread of antimicrobial resistant bacteria in animals and humans. In an ironic twist, the antibiotics that kill the bacteria that would kill the patient have now created bacteria that can no longer be killed by these antibiotics and will therefore kill the patient. Antibiotic resistance is real. This here is a call for action. Motorists, when driving on the road, here are some simple reminders. Look out for and extend courtesy to all road users. Give plenty of room to pedestrians, especially in wet weather. Drive slowly, no bother wet them up. Slow down when approaching a pedestrian crossing or school and always be prepared to stop. Remember, a school zone is a 30 kilometer zone. Cut your speed. Drivers of large and slow moving vehicles should always keep in the far left hand of a dual carriageway. Keep it simple, drive left, and pass right. These are just simple reminders of your road duties. Drive safely. Thanks for watching another edition of Jamaica Magazine. Join us again tomorrow when we'll do this all over again. Send your feedback on today's show to jamaicamagazine at jis.gov.jm. Also, follow us on our social media pages and download our app on your Apple and Android devices. And you can also visit our website at jis.gov.jm for more information. Don't forget too that this and other programs can be found on our YouTube channel. So on behalf of the entire production crew, I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.